Now here on the screen behind me, you see the subject for today, autofocus. Now as a selling point, many new machines are sold with this autofocus system built into them because it's a very attractive system as a sales tool to entice new users that are not familiar with laser technology into buying a machine. Makes it very easy, doesn't it? It says it on the tin, autofocus. I'm afraid it's not quite as simple as that once you get into it. And I've become very aware of that just recently with several correspondents that have been writing to me, asking me about this autofocus system. And I realized, stupidly, that I wasn't thinking basically enough. Autofocus to me has never meant what it means to a lot of new users. And by that, I mean to say, if you swap and change your lenses around, it auto focuses. You don't have to do anything. I'm afraid it's not quite as simple as that. They're being misled very slightly by this term autofocus. I think we ought to start from square one for those new users that are just about to buy a machine or have bought a machine with autofocus on it to explain what this autofocus is all about. If you're one of those people that already knows a lot about autofocus, focusing lenses, etc., etc., then please stop now because the next half, three quarters of an hour is not going to be useful to you. It's only going to be useful to people that have not got much understanding of laser technology. So let's get stuck in and go right back to the beginning. So this will help you recognize an autofocus system when you first open up your machine. If it's a small desktop machine, there are a few around that have got this sort of autofocus system on them. Basically, both of these are just simple switches. This one has got a mechanical contact on it, which contacts the surface of your material down here. You can see the material is coming up towards it and it's about a six millimeter gap. So the reflection there is 12 millimeters away. And when this presses up against this spring, it activates this switch here. And this switch stops the table from rising. Now this system here is exactly the same. What we've got here is a switch. Okay, it's a slightly different design and this is often called a pen. Now both of these systems work the same way. Coming out of the nozzle here, we've got the laser beam. And at a certain point beyond this nozzle, the laser beam is what they call in focus. We'll talk about that in a second. And this switch attempts to set the table height so that the focus position for the beam is on the surface of the material. And this one does exactly the same thing. Now there's a bit of a difference between these two systems in that this head here has got no vertical adjustment. All the adjustment that you've got on this machine is table adjustment up and down. So the table is motorized with a stepper motor. And it's sort of, I suppose, intelligent in that it goes through an autofocus routine where the table comes up, the switch senses the position of the table and says, ah, uh -uh, you're in the right position now, stop. And this one does exactly the same thing. So you undo this locking collar and the actual lens tube itself can raise and lower as well as the table coming up and down. So we're looking to put this so-called focus for the lens at a particular position relative to the end of the nozzle. When you come to replace your lens, you will have to make a couple of decisions. Do you want a different lens or are you going to buy the same lens? And you'll have to try and establish what its focal distance is as well. So you can get the same replacement lens. There are no little bits in between these. These are typical distances that you can buy. Some of these lenses are more difficult to get hold of than others. One inch is available, but difficult. One and a half, two, two and a half, and four are very popular sizes that you can buy anywhere and everywhere. Lenses are not quite as simple as just a focal length. So if you look at the classic literature, everywhere and anywhere, you will find that this is what they will tell you about lenses. If you've got a four inch focal length lens, it will look like this. In other words, it's exactly what you probably saw in your science classes at school. It tends to close down to a focal point and then it opens up below the focal point again. I mean, this is how telescopes work. This is how cameras work. 
And at this point just here, which is called the focal point, there is a size in there called a spot size. That's an important word to remember, spot size. And what they tell you here is, look, for these particular sizes of lens, focal length of lenses, these are the spot sizes you can expect. In other words, these are the burns that you should be able to get from your laser beam. Sadly, this is not true. Everything in this drawing is rubbish <laughs> when it comes to lasers. It's perfectly okay if you want to build a telescope or a camera or a projector, but they don't work for lasers. Now that's very controversial, but it's not controversial at all because it's very easily provable. At the focal distance here, supposedly a tolerance over which you can achieve the same sort of cutting results. Again, this tolerance here is something which has been devised and invented for cameras going a little bit in and out of focus. You wouldn't, it doesn't matter if a camera goes just a little bit in or a little bit out of focus because you won't notice it. And that's what this range is for. It actually doesn't apply for laser cutting at all. So having told you that one of the tenets of lens theory is already not working for us, let's move on. Let's look at the lens types that you've got. You what? There's more than one lens type? Yes, there is. There are things called spheric lenses and there are things called aspheric lenses. Now, aspheric lenses, as you can see, do exactly what you expect a lens to do. They focus all the light down to a single point. But unfortunately, we can't buy aspheric lenses for our machine. The only sort of lens that we can buy for our machine are these things. Hang on. Look, there isn't a focal point. Is the red one the focal point or is the blue one the focal point? Make up your mind. So, confusion number two. The problem is, the only lenses that we can buy, as I said, are spheric, ge spherical geometry lenses. In other words, this piece here is part of a sphere. Here is what we can buy. A normal, what they call plano, which is a flat surface, convex, which is a raised up surface, so this is a plano convex lens with a flat surface underneath. And this is the way in which the lens has been designed. It's been designed so that you put the curved surface upwards and the rays pass through it and they come down to this, well, let's call it a fuzzy focus point. <laughs> okay, because this is what we've got with spherical geometry. You can spend the most amount of money you ever want to spend on a lens. I'm afraid this is an optical property. This is not a property of manufacturing. So to try and get more of an aspheric lens performance from just straightforward spherical geometry, there's a trick that they can perform, and that is to put a secondary concave surface onto our flat lens. And what that does, that brings the lens focus down to almost. It gets rid of about 95% of this fuzziness and we get much more of the performance of an aspheric lens. So cheaply, we get a copy-ish of this. Now it's important that you know that there are two types of lens because, you know, later on, when you get to know a lot more about lenses, you will understand that our laser beam is a rather special form of light. These are light rays and light rays are the same regardless of whether they're part of a laser beam or part of normal light. They will pass through the lens and perform like this. And so our laser rays are busy performing damage to material. They're not interested in sending images up onto a screen or into your eye. Now, just when you thought things were getting a bit complicated with lenses, they get even worse. Because there are different types of lens material that you can choose from when you buy a lens. And I've just basically summarized the three main materials that you can see when you buy lenses off of internet, CloudRay, Amazon, Alibaba, wherever you buy your lenses from, they're gonna be optically approximately the same. 
there are very limited lens materials that you can buy for a, a, a CO2 laser machine. And they're special materials that are manufactured from mainly this material here, zinc selenide. Now, zinc selenide is a material that is in itself only about 70% effective at transmitting light through the lens. That can go up to maybe 95 to 99% by the addition of a coating on the lens. And you've seen this coating. If you look at a camera lens or a telescope lens, it's got a slight bluish bloom to it. Well, that's what they put on here. They put a special anti-reflective coating on the lens because it's not the lens that's absorbing 30% of light, it's the material which is reflecting 30% of the light off the surface. So provided you can get that extra 30% of the light into the lens, it'll pass through the lens. The same applies to this material here, which looks completely different and is completely different, called gallium arsenide. Here it is, gallium arsenide. You can't actually see through this material and you wonder how on earth can this be a lens material if you can't see through it? You can't see through it, but 10.6 micron wavelength light laser beams can see through this like a pane of glass. So this is another material that is used for lenses, but it's really only these two basic materials, zinc selenide and gallium arsenide, that we can use. Now, things get a little bit more complicated because the zinc selenide is into two specific groups. You can buy these lovely bright yellow lenses, which are CVD lenses, and CVD stands for chemical vapor deposition. It's the manufacturing process by which this material is made. It's a bit made a bit like they make silicon chips for computers. It's a very special laboratory process. And then what we've got here, we've got these processes here, which are made in China. These are called PVD, physical vapor deposition. It's a different process for manufacturing the same material, zinc selenide. The only problem is this material produces different properties to this material. When you look at lenses, you will see certain types of lenses that look very brown, like amber, very dark yellow, goldy colour. These are lenses that you really need to steer away from unless you've got a K40 machine. If you've got anything over 40 watts, then these will not perform because they have got a 40 watt maximum power limit. Start going beyond that and the lens will start degrading and it will heat up and maybe eventually crack. So generally we stay steer clear of these dark brown lenses. And then we've got a slightly more yellowy golden honey colored lens which are very different to the bright yellow of the CVD lenses and these are the sort of lenses that we can buy normally for our machines and they work very well they're cost effective these work up to 80 watts so most of our machines these will be perfectly okay optically these all lenses perform roughly the same when I say perform roughly the same, you know, they will, if it says two inch focal length, it'll be a two inch focal length. Um, it's just the power transmission through the lens as starts to be limited. Certain properties of this material, which I'm not going to go into, start degrading once you put more than a certain energy density through them. So we've got these three lenses. This one is the most popular, A, which is a sort of a lightish honey color. Then we've got the more expensive lens, which is the CVD lens, and this can go from mid price to very expensive. Remember what I said earlier, very expensive doesn't mean to say it's going to perform any better because it's still got this strange property called aberration, spherical aberration, which you can't get rid of. It's an optical property. And then we've got this strange material here on the end called gallium arsenide, which basically it's a very hard durable lens which can take a lot more punishment than these lenses this coating on the surface is much harder and it can go up to much higher wattages so 200 watts and beyond that's way beyond what most of our machines are going to be capable of using very cheap cheap mid-range to very expensive very expensive now you understand that there are different focal length lenses and what we're trying to achieve is the focal point 
at the work surface. But the focal point at the work surface really depends on where the lens is in this tube. So if we want the focal point to be there, we've got to put the lens up there if it's a longer focal length lens. Or conversely, if we're going to fix the focal length lens in that position, then we need to raise everything up so that the focal point is not down here, but sits on the work surface. In other words, we've got a much bigger gap between the nozzle and the work surface as we increase the focal length. That's enough theory. Let's just go out to the workshop now and see what the advantages and the problems of an autofocus system are. Here we are at my machine and you'll notice that's what I do with my pen. It's normally over there. I don't use it. It hasn't been on this machine for probably five or six years. Soon after I got the machine I took it off because I personally find it's just a nuisance. When I took this off my machine I didn't actually remove this part so it's still physically able to run on this machine. The problem is I've got a special lightweight head on here you see it's, it's, it's half of nothing so that I can make this machine move around quite rapidly with its accelerations. I might be able to make it work to show you to demonstrate to you how it works. As I said this is the last thing I considered when I redesigned this head. So there we go we've got our pen back in in operation again. This table at the moment is set to Z0. It comes right up to the top and on the keyboard here it says Z equals zero. If I drive the table down a long way we should be able to look in the side of the machine just here. You can see a micro switch. This is coming up to the top of the stroke. It's going through an autofocus routine. It comes up to the top of the stroke then it goes down very slightly then it comes up then it drops down and down and down and down and down and stops. I'll just get close into the x-axis and you'll see the same action happening on there. When I press reset, you'll see the head goes towards the micro switch. Then it runs away from it very slowly. Then it runs towards it. Then it runs away again. And it's the second running away from the micro switch which detects the switch turning off and that sets the zero for the x-axis. The same happens for the y-axis and now you've seen the same happening for the z-axis. Let's do a reset. X is reset, y is reset and the table is coming up. Click. It's going down. Click. Two clicks on that and it set the table down there we should find that X, Y and Z are all zero. Now a long time ago I decided that that pen was pretty useless. I could achieve the same thing and have my table zero wherever I want. You watch the table coming up, click and there we go. I've now set zero at that point. So I've duplicated the function of that switch, that switch with my own switch so that I can set my table zero to anywhere I want without using this. That's why I've been able to throw my autofocus pen away. For new users it has got a function and it is very useful provided you understand that it has limitations. I know this session is all about this thing but hey we can't do anything with this until we understand roughly what we're trying to do with lenses. What we're going to do is just very quickly take a few moments out and tell you what you should and shouldn't be doing with these lenses. Well, lots of people will tell you you shouldn't be doing what I'm doing, handling this lens, because this is a toxic material. Well, it is a toxic material underneath, but remember, this material has been coated with quite a thick coating of anti-reflective material which is not in itself toxic all right and it's also pretty durable it's not soft the lens itself if you drop it from any significant height just maybe six inches or so onto a hard surface it will shatter this is not yellow glass this is almost like a salt crystal it's very delicate so you need to handle it carefully it's not super important and it has no significant effect on the ability of this lens to perform its task properly if there is a little finger mark on it. How do you know when your lens is dirty? Well, if you take a look on the underneath of your lens here, which is the side facing down to the work, if you hold it in the light and catch it just right, you'll see that there'd be a mark in the middle of your lens, which is not 
uniformly shiny across the whole surface. That tells you you've got something in the middle there that you should be removing. Look, I've got a special tool here to help me clean lenses. I open it up, pop it on the lens, and it clamps the lens for me nicely. I've got some isopropyl alcohol here, so I'm gonna spray some isopropyl alcohol on here. And what you do, you take a cotton bud, and you very carefully, with circular motion, you work your way from the centre to the outside of the lens, but keep going in circular motions. The other side of the lens is rarely going to get dirty, but while you've got your kit out, you might as well give the other side of the lens a clean as well. Isopropyl alcohol is a lovely material, but it evaporates. Now, if I catch it in the light right, you might be able to see that it's a bit streaked across the surface. I've purposely done that with my finger to show you how it's streaking. But what we need to do is take that film off with some lens cleaning tissues. Now these are just camera lens tissues which you can buy at any camera shop. An alternative would be toilet paper, soft toilet paper. If it's good enough for your bottom it's good enough for these lenses. This kitchen roll on here is great for a soft back surface to use when you're working with lenses but it's not suitable for cleaning the lens because this has got abrasive material in it. Wipe the lens very gently to take the film off the surface and there we go it's fit to put into the lens hole. This is a lens tube from a C-series head but this on this machine is not a C-series head it's a special head that I've designed myself. Now this lens tube is a great lens tube because you'll see that it's got some marks on it. It's got a mark at the bottom here and one at the top. That's because this lens tube is designed to work with a nozzle that looks like this, which most of you will have, um, which has got a very small hole in the end. And this hole makes it a cutting nozzle, as opposed to a nozzle that looks like this with a big hole in the end, which is an engraving nozzle. When it's assembled on here, has got a distance, a focal distance of about seven millimeters beyond the end of the nozzle. That's where the focal point of a two inch lens will sit. Now, if we turn this round like this, you'll see that it's got a different mark on it here. And this is to take a two and a half inch lens. And again, when you put your lens in there and put this nozzle on it, the focal point will be about seven millimeters out the end here. And now we've got this turned around this way. Look, the mark, is at the top here and when I put a put when I put a lens in there that will be a four inch lens and the four inch lens will focus up seven millimeters beyond the nozzle so this is a very carefully designed lens tube that makes sure that your focal distance is approximately the same regardless of what sort of lens you put in there so we're going to put a two inch lens in the two inch end and remember what I said to you when we looked at lenses the curved side is upwards. Now I'm not going to try and confuse you with anything else at the moment but just stick by those basic rules. They've served everybody for many years and they will serve you as well. I'm not worried about putting a finger mark on there but I will try not to and we drop that into. If you put it in there with curved side downwards facing you you will be able to see the whole of your head in there not just your eye. So you'll know which way round your lens is. Now this particular clamp ring has got a little uh, soft washer built onto the, onto the actual clamp ring itself. There are tools that you can use for doing this job. I'm using my fingernails in this slot, but there are also holes in here as well. Once you feel it biting, just give it a little touch. Provided the lens isn't rattling, that's perfect. This table is now sitting at position zero. It's as high as it can possibly go. Because I put that lens in there, and I know that this is approximately seven millimeters below there for the focal point. I've got a little step gauge that I've made here. I could set that to seven millimeters like this, six, seven millimeters, and know that that is approximately, approximately the right focal point. But I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is find out exactly what the correct focal point is for that lens. And so, I've got a program which I've written for this machine which works because of the table going up and down. You've got the ability to write programs that you can use Z in, not just X and Y. That's a bit complicated at the moment for a newcomer, but I'm going to demonstrate what I do for setting up my focal point. So 
I know that that, uh, that first step is two millimeters, three millimeters, four millimeters. What I'm going to do, I'm going to set that down right there. Drop it down. Look how easy it was. Drop it down onto the two millimeter step. Now the corner of that board is lifting up just a bit, so I'm going to put a magnet on there. Just to hold it nice and flat and level, because this board is very slightly curved. Once this program starts, the table drops one millimeter, one millimeter, one millimeter, one millimeter. And then it comes back to zero. Whatever the thinnest line is, that's the focus that we're trying to set to. We started off with a gap of two millimeters on our gauge. So the first line was two millimeters, three, four, five, six, seven millimeters. What did I tell you about the setting for that nozzle? It's about seven millimeters. Well, there's the proof. Now, that's the technique that I use for setting the focal point. And look, we've got a convenient piece of material here which enables me to set up a ramp. Yeah. So it's got to be in clearance right at the top of the ramp. By setting your speed here to say something like 20 millimeters a second, and then set your max and min power to 2020 when I did it just now. And then what you can do, you can hold down the pulse button and at the same time the arrow button, depending on which way you're going to run up and down your ramp, You see that what we've produced is a profile of the beam width. And the beam goes from wide to narrow at the focal point back to wide again as the beam goes below the focal point. It's much more difficult to find the exact focal point with the ramp test. The line becomes thin over a fairly long range and it's difficult to say exactly where the focal point is. Maybe it's about there to put your head back to that position there. Measure it. That says it's six millimeters. There is yet another way of determining the focal point. Let's just say we'll drop it down to four millimeters. And we do a pulse. Beep. We'll run along a little bit. We'll set it to five millimeters. And we do another pulse. Beep. So look, it's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Is more accurate than the ramp test. And this is good enough for what you want. Now your machine will come with its autofocus preset up and I very much doubt whether your supplier will have told you how to set it up or how he's even set it up. So I'm going to go through this from scratch to try and explain how things work. Now if ever you have your system off you must make sure that you put it back on against a reference face of some sort. There will normally be a collar of some sort on your lens tube. In this particular instance I'm going to be using the nozzle itself because that stands out just a little bit more than anything else. Now the reason you do that is so if ever you have to take it off for any reason when you put it back you won't have changed the setting for the switch itself. It really doesn't matter what the surface is but I've just called it table zero at the moment for convenience. The problem with this switch is it's not an instant switch. The table comes up quite quickly and it pushes the switch until it puts the switch on. So it pushes the switch up to make an on signal and as soon as the switch switches on it says ah, ah I need to go down now and so it switches off slowly with that mauve line but it's going down one and a half millimeters before it switches off and then it goes back on again and then it comes back off very, very, very slowly so that it can get an exact switch off point for that switch. And then it says, right, that's table zero. But look, table zero is different to switch on. And it's also different to the natural position that that switch is sitting at. If that's not complicated enough, your vendor would have also done something in the vendor settings. We've got to go and look in the vendor settings to see what he's done. We shall need to go into File, Vendor Settings, and it'll ask you for a password. Well, the password is a secret password that everybody knows, 
and it's called RD and four eights, one, two, three, four. And that will get you into the secret squirrel section of your software that you're not supposed to know about. But it's essential that you do know about it if you're going to be your own 24 seven service technician. Right, so the first thing we must do is press our read button. And we are reading the information from the machine down our USB cable into the PC. So now we know what the vendor has put into the machine. And we take a look here at Z, the Z axis. But the important thing is to look here is what the home offset is. The home offset at the moment is zero. And I will demonstrate what that means, zero. Now in terms of this diagram, what zero means is that the table will switch on, switch off, switch on, switch off and set zero. And that's where the table will stop because I've got a home offset of zero. If I've got a home offset of five, then once it's detected zero for the table, it will then say, uh, but you don't really want that as zero, do you? The zero that you want is one, two, three, four, five millimeters lower. So it will actually set zero five millimeters lower than the switch that you make. Now, that will be useful to you in a few moments time. But in the, in the meantime, what I'm going to do is leave it set to zero. Okay, so we've got a piece of material that goes under our nozzle there now. But what we've got to do first of all is detect the switch on position for this switch. Now, how do we do that? Well, we go into our keypad and we press the ZU button on our 6442 controller. Not, not everybody will have this, so you'll have to find your own way of doing this if your controller is different. Somewhere down here, you'll find there is a table which says diagnostics. So we can go to the bottom of the table by going upwards to diagnostics, enter. And here we've got a whole load of micro switches. One of those micro switches, and I'll just press it, happens to be our sensor. As I press it, look, it's turning on and off. I'm going to drop the nozzle onto the surface of the material. Loosen the pen off and I'm very carefully pushing it down until it comes on. Then I'll lock the pen to represent on. You should be able to watch that gap close to zero as the switch goes to the on position. Okay, the nozzle didn't crash. Now it's gone to the off position where we see a one and a half millimeter gap. That's the one and a half millimeter gap I showed you on the diagram. Okay, but if we look again, and I pull this out the way, look. There's another one millimeter, or maybe one and a half millimeters of, mo of motion in the actual sensor itself. So I can't set my autofocus to that position because it won't work. Remember, we're trying to set a seven millimeter gap below the nozzle for our focus. So the fact that we've got one and a half millimeters there means I've got to drop this by another 5.5 millimeters. So I can put the home offset position now to 5.5. And I need to then write that back into the machine because we've got to send that new information back to the machine. And I've done it. Without changing anything, let's put the sensor back on that surface. We'll run the autofocus procedure again. So I've got to go to ZU, find autofocus at the bottom of the menu. The gap will go to zero under the nozzle. The switch will make saying I've registered zero at the top of the stroke. And then it will drop down by one and a half millimeters. And then all of a sudden, we get our other five and a half millimeters coming into play. And what do we finish up with? So there we go. We've now set our focus pen to seven millimeters. Although I've shown you how to set that up with zero so that I can show you the various dimensions that happen, I wouldn't ever advise you to do what I've just done. Get yourself a three millimeter thick material and put it under the nozzle. 
Okay, and then we'll go through this same procedure again of undoing the pen. And then we'll go into diagnostics, but you must press the up down arrows, not the sideways arrows. And we'll get to diagnostics. It's still on, and I've locked my sensor up. I'm now going to drop the table away. I'm going to take our spacer out. So we're now going to do an autofocus and it should stop three millimeters short of this material here. And there it is. It's finding zero and now it's dropping away by the dimension that we told it to which is five and a half millimeters. So five and a half millimeters we put in to get seven millimeters. We've just added three millimeters in, so we should finish up with a 10 millimeter gap. And now we've got to change this value from five, we've got to take three millimeters off. So it's now going to be 2.5. And write that back to the machine so the machine knows what information we've put into it and autofocus again. And this time we should finish up with a seven millimeter gap. six, seven. There we go, we've got our seven millimeter gap. And let's just check whether it auto focuses. We'll go ZU, step down to the bottom of the menu and press enter. The table drops away by 2.5 millimeters and, and a great big piece of thick Acrylic. We need to drop the table down now. Z, U, and drop the table down so that this passes underneath it. And then we'll drop down to the bottom of the menu where it says auto focus. Enter. Seven. So regardless of the material thickness that we've put on there now, it will auto focus to seven millimeters. Perfect. That's how simple it is for you new guys. Once you've got your machine set up or your vendor will have set it up for you already. Okay, hopefully set it to the right dimensions to give you perfect focus. The problem is, what happens when you want to change it to a different focal distance? Well, I've just shown you the procedure. You remember me showing this picture earlier. Lens, focal point, distance from the nozzle. If we want to change the lens to a different focal distance, there are two choices really. Whatever happens, you will probably have to just very slightly reset this if you're not using exactly the same lens because no two lenses will be exactly the same focal point. If we make the focal distance longer, if you keep the lens in the same place, the same diameter beam is going to project further out the front of the nozzle. But as it projects further out the front of the nozzle, look what happens just here. It won't pass through the hole in the end of the nozzle. It'll just heat the nozzle up. But there is a solution to that problem. Look, here we are. We've got a nozzle, we've got the same focal point. If we put our focal point there, look, I've drawn the same green beam and it comes out at the end. The only thing is the nozzle has moved forward by half an inch or so. How is that possible? Well, there are things around that enable you to do just that. You can buy extension pieces about half an inch long. Now, as it happens, this particular lens holder has got both a two inch and a two and a half inch in it because look it goes much much deeper to take the two and a half inch lens. You can turn that two inch seat into a two and a half inch by adding a half an inch extension piece on it and then putting your nozzle on. So that's one way to do it as I've shown you there, putting an extension piece in there and using your existing lens holder. The alternative is what we have here and that's to buy a lens tube with a different seating in it, which is half an inch further back. 
which is exactly what this one is. It's got a much deeper lens seat in it. Okay, well I hope that's about as much as you'll ever want to know about that red stick there. Yeah, it's autofocus under certain conditions. But remember, you're the one with the grey cells, not this. For me, the best place for this is over there until I need to demonstrate it to somebody else. Well, I hope to see you in the next video session if you're not too offended.